Uh, we'll call the meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. on the 10th of November. Uh, first item on the agenda is uh, approval of minutes. Um, we have minutes to approve from the 20th of October and the 27th of October. The 20th was a very brief meeting. Um, uh, do I hear a motion to approve the 20th? Move uh, yes, the 20th. I, I'll second that. All right. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. Um, do I hear a motion to... Um, I move to approve the other meetings minutes. The October 27th meeting. Second. Yes. All right. Uh, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. I will uh, abstain because I was not present, so I can't, I don't feel like I can make a a valid okay. judgment of the meetings of the minutes um vendor and payroll warrant warrants have been done anybody have an issue no issues. Not me. anybody have any public comments not listed on the agenda okay scheduled appointments uh john dewey whitley mustang to discuss the status of the marijuana cultivation establishment located at the corner of State Road and Christian Lane. Is John here? No, I just re I just sent him the All right. login information. So let's hold off on that. We'll move to Circle K to request a change of officers on the uh, retail alcohol license for Circle K convenience store located on 116. Is anybody from Circle K here or do they need to be, Brian? Um, I don't think they need to be, they were invited. Um, it's kind of a administrative thing. They're changing the, they're just changing a, a officer. They're not changing a corporate officer. Um, they're not changing anything about their operations. Okay. So the manager's not changing either. No. Okay. Do we approve, do we vote on this or do we, we sign something? Yeah, there's a, a local licensing authority, you know, just a, right. to amend the application. All right. So do I hear a motion to approve of the change of officers? Yeah. At Circle K on 16. There isn't any reason why we wouldn't do this. Like they haven't been cited or anything recently. I would have heard of that if they had been. Okay. And I you would move that, yeah, that we uh, approve their application to change the officers. I'll second that. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. Uh, we will keep going down and then we'll pivot back to John Dewey uh, when he arrives, if he arrives. Um, status of town buildings and COVID measures. Brian? Yeah, so in the meeting, um, the Board of Health met last Tuesday um, and I asked them to consider um, discussing and making a recommendation to the select board for um, reopening town buildings and they um, sent a letter to the select board and I'll, I'll bring it up. Here in a second. I have it on page forty five of that big long document. <laughs> okay. Don't look at the screen, it's going to make you ill. Um, so um, here's the letter. Um, so it essentially says, first, they recommend the safest way to hold municipal functions and meetings is to continue the practice of holding them remotely whenever possible. And then when indoor, in-person, personal meeting functions are needed, they recommend the following precautions. Uh, limited capacity, masking, uh, mask required, social distancing, air purification, which is in place in both town offices um, and town hall. Um, attendee login or sign-in sheets be kept for, if there needs to be contact tracing. And then um, hopefully it goes without saying, but I think it needs to be said that the persons with active COVID symptoms should not um, come to an in-person meeting or if they're um, unvaccinated and with uh, recent uh, COVID disease exposure, they should not attend in-person meetings either. And then they list uh, some of the more common symptoms of, of COVID-19. And they and the Board of Health says that it, 
this is something that they're going to continue to keep an eye on. And if, um, if COVID trends worsen, then they'll provide, you know, follow-up recommendations to the board. Um, in, in terms of, in terms of vaccine requirements for, for private meetings, um, the board of health is continuing to have discussions with town council on that in terms of the, um, the details of, of what that policy would look like. Um, so we don't really have anything to report on that other than they're having discussions about it. So I guess if I could summarize, I think the recommendation is that, that if, you know, if municipal boards and committees can meet, um, remotely, they should continue to do so. Um, if there's reasons that, you know, the meeting needs to happen in person, um, then they would recommend that, that the, uh, requirements that I listed before be in place, mm -hmm. all subject to whatever happens in the next two weeks, because um, mm. it seems to have plateaued and it might be going the wrong direction. So we'll see. Mm. So if, if, um, if I like uh, summarize kind of from like, what kind of action do we have to take Point of view. If we continue to maintain that our public meetings will be remote um, unless it's required, uh, we do have sort of a the chair and the town administrator can decide if some board really needs to meet in person. There's that exception already in our policy. <clears throat> but if we keep our existing policy, that's certainly consistent with this. And then when we have a, a special town meeting or an annual town meeting, then this is what we have to do for in-person meetings. It seems like there's not any particular action we have to take here, but we could take the action of loosening up the requirement that meetings be remote if we wanted to. That's kind of what I'm hearing here. Is that a reasonable inference? Yeah. Well, did, wasn't council's guidance on this that the Board of Health um, recommendations are actually controlling rather than what we say? I thought that was like, we can't do a vaccine mandate. They can do a max vaccine mandate, right? So we can't require, we can't make the declaration that you have to have vaccines to use town buildings. But I think that that was that was really re if you're going to mandate something like vaccines, this is what you'd have to do. Um, here we're really we're just we're well, I guess we're mandating masks at any rate, um, and social distancing and capacity and air purification and so at least that's what the, the board of health is is mandating. And it seems like our policy is consistent with that at the moment. Although I don't know if our policy specifies air purification. I um, I actually think that the air purification is, is a nice add. Um, I, I have no problem if committees want to justify the need to meet in person with a true justification. The problem is we have no, we have no um, we have no no written guidelines around what a what a strong justification would be and what a not so strong justification would be. So I, I worry about gray area, but um, I have no problem with with, with me and Brian um, reviewing those those requests. I know personally, I would <clears throat> I would look be looking for quite a high bar. Um, to justify an in-person meeting um, just because it is logistically a challenge to do Zoom and it, it, it just, I've been a part of them and it's, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah. You know, that being said, I also understand, you know, I, I, I go around this state all the time and no one wears a mask indoors and there's no 50% capacity thing. So I, I, I worry that things are going to go in the opposite direction because we it seems like we in in this part of the state are in a little bubble in terms of our our preventative measures 
Um, I mean, literally, you, you can you can see hundreds of people in a in a in a gymnasium, Hun- literally hundreds. There are no masks, um, and people are crunched in pretty pretty tight. Uh, so I worry that it's going to go in the opposite direction yet again. Um, but I would add their pur- purification to our standards, and I would I, I would let people ask for just you know ask to meet per these guidelines if, if you guys were amenable. I, I That's sort of the keep the policy the way it is more or less um, and maybe add some verbiage about the air purification um, portion. Um, but it, that seems like, like doing the minimal amount to, of changing to our policy, just updating it to, to add the air purification, but still keeping our main uh, you know, that we expect meetings to be still held remotely. And I, I'm, I'm completely fine with letting the, uh, you know, having our one flexibility is if you really can have a compelling case about needing to meet in person, then we've got a way for you to do that, which doesn't involve me doing anything, which is nice. <laughs> the, 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 because I'm the one who does have to do something potentially. The, the right, great right. And next year it'll be me, right? So the, right. the gray area. Well, hopefully we'll be beyond this, Joyce. So you'll be you'll be obfuscated from that responsibility. Um, uh, well, okay. <laughs> but, Can always but, hope. But um, the gray area does frighten me. I'll, I'll be honest, because it, it's it's a it's a it's a slippery slope. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Fred, how do you okay. feel? I'm. I'm fine with going with the Board of Health regulations, adding the air air purification, uh, especially since we're really not up to speed on a hybrid meeting yet. We don't have the technology in place to do it effectively. Right. Uh, yeah. in, In-person meetings do in, uh, tend to encourage public participation more than Zoom meetings do. And that's, well, you think they, they, Fred, you think they encourage what? I think more people show up at a, have, I've seen more people at select board meetings that are live than I've seen joining in, just spectating here on Zoom. I don't know, Fred, I've been doing oh, this yeah, for, eight, I've been doing this for 18 years now, and I haven't seen a lot of participation regardless of whether it's live or, 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 or you know. Okay, well, some of the meetings I've been to, there have been other people there. <laughs> yeah. Unlike our meetings, on Zoom, where there's been essentially no one else there. Well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that because there were, especially when it was, um, when it was a brand new thing, people would just, uh, you know, join in and listen. And they're not always the same people who might show up in person and listen. Um, so I, I thought, I thought when you know that first year that we did it, we had more participation. Um, it may have dropped off because now like it's, oh, Zoom, Shmoom, you can do that anytime, right? But uh, um, maybe it was the novelty. It, it may I, just I, be a matter of what's being discussed. I remember in particular the uh, castaway yeah. meetings were very well attended. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, and consider the... Um, the Try to forget those. <laughs> I mean, yeah. geez, right. that was, the, that was, the, the, that was the, the nightmare scenario. You know, that was not a pleasant experience, so. Yeah. All right. Um, do I hear a motion to accept these uh, measures as stated in the Board of Health letter? Yeah, I would say I, I, I move that we accept these and update our policy at the next meeting to include any additional verbiage to be uh, uh, consistent. Second. Uh, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Brad? Yes. Me? Yes. Um, I would be curious what the school policy is. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, there are going to be a lot of a lot of a lot of basketball games going on and practices going on um, coming up. Now, school, schools are still masking, I believe. We're school, not at eighty percent during the school day or masking. I, I just don't know what their policy um, mm-hmm. is going to be for extracurriculars that that are not mm-hmm. quote unquote school functions. And those those games and practices are absolutely not school functions. They are town mm-hmm. town of Wheatley functions. We just happen to be using that 
um, for mm. that facility. So yeah. I, I'm and and the policing of that is going to be extraordinarily difficult. Mm. Uh, yeah. So I I wonder whether there should be a conversation, and and I'm open to having that conversation here. Though basketball season is going to be starting, and I, I worry we're a little bit behind the eight ball. Um, I just don't think every, everyone's looking at each other. Um, and I just wonder whether we should have that conversation with the school because, again, it's not a school function. It's a town function. We're just using a, t- a school facility and policing. It, you know, it just – I coached for a lot of years, as everyone knows, <clears throat> and the thought of going around in a gym filled with 50 people, half of which aren't from our town, um, to tell people to put on masks – um, you know, people are there to to give the kids a great experience. They're not there to um, be the, the 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 COVID police. And so I worry about the, the the functionality of all that indoors. It's a tight it's a tight space, as everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I Brian, think we should fully expect that visitors to the school will abide by the school's rules. Yeah. But I understand that it's a hard thing to enforce. So yeah, I think I agree. The conversation should happen, and we should be well informed about what's going on there. I, I, I sort of wonder whether we should invite um, the school principal in as well as the rec committee chair into our December meeting, if that continues to be the schedule and, and have that conversation so that everybody is absolutely on the same page. And we also know that the pros and cons and the e- the easy stuff and the, and the not so easy stuff. And, and it should be really be a, 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 not an idealistic meeting, but a, a come to Jesus meeting. I'm fine with that. And, okay. and I would think you would probably want the Board of Health to yeah. provide yeah. a recommendation. So, Well, the Board of Health last time, I believe, kicked it to the school. I'm not sure of that. I could be, I could be very wrong about that. I just know that, that if, yeah. again, if you go to athletic events across the state in gymnasiums, a big zero wear masks and certainly not the players. Uh, you might see a couple, a couple parents who are wearing masks, but it just, it just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. No, let's have the support. conversation then. What's that? Let's have the conversation yep. at our next meeting then. Okay. Um, is Circle K here yet? <clears throat> I'm sorry, not Circle K. Wait, we must then. No, um, no, I, I let him know that it was on the 10th. Um, All right, let's keep we moving. Had that. Conversation yep. since then. I um, think our meeting might be done by seven. Christian Lane Culver oh. Project. <clears throat> um, so as you know, this is, this is talking about the Culver uh, Christian Lane between um, Castaways and uh, the Zawinski's house or the fire station is the next building people might mm-hmm. recognize. Um, and Keith, Hannah, and myself met with engineers from Tyne Bond to have a preliminary discussion about what we think the design costs might be for that culvert. Um, we were a little surprised, but maybe we shouldn't be with the cost of everything these days. But, you know, they ballparked the, <clears throat> the design cost to be somewhere between 90000 um, and 120000 depending on, you know, if they were going to go back in, in, in crunch the numbers, so to speak. And the grant amount that we have is, is for 57,000. Um, so they were gonna give us proposals as to, here's what we can do with 57,000 and here's what it's gonna take to bring it to you know design where we can submit it for permitting. Um, so we need to talk a little bit about where that difference may be made up, um, I guess just sort of theoretically for a minute. Um, but before we get to that, I, I want to jump ahead. It's, it's what was listed under, under town administrator updates, but Keith and I and Hannah had a, had a Microsoft Teams call, I guess I don't want to call it a Zoom call, with mass DOT officials to talk about, you know, the intersection there, in, in, including the culvert, um, really for two reasons. One was we wanted to make sure that whatever culvert that we design on Christian Lane doesn't limit or... Um, doesn't limit what's done with that intersection. If in the future there's, you know, intersection mm-hmm. realignment or it's, or or it's changed, right? To to improve the safety of that intersection, and sort of 
Um, also in that conversation, we wanted to talk about the, the safety of the intersection itself, which has always been a concern that um, it's just not the safest intersection in terms of line of sight. And, you know, what, what tells us it's not safe is, is the crash data, right? I mean, that's a pretty good indicator that people are having trouble navigating that intersection. Is it that bad for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I don't know what that bad means, but I mean, we had a serious accident probably within the past three weeks, probably Keith, two weeks, yes, three weeks. Sir. There was yeah, another serious accident there. But, but there um, are serious accidents in a lot of places and they happen, unfortunately. I don't think at the, at the frequency of, at, 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 that's at that's sort of my question about what's the data. I mean, you, we, we, we haven't there been another serious accident like six weeks previous? I, I recall there um, being two accidents. In the yes, there was. There's, there's been numerous ones, and it's it's probably it's certainly one of the highest crash locations in the town of Waitley, and it also ranks up there fairly high in Franklin County. However, it's um, ten years ago there was a road safety audit done. Some of the um, the low cost aspects of that audit. Yeah. have been done and were done however not everything the biggest expense that wasn't done was to the south of the intersection was suggested that route five be raised where that culvert crosses route five so that line of sight and visibility is better um but that's a major expense and at this point in time our you know what we got out of mass dot today was they there is nothing on the near radar with them to do anything more with that intersection major we did talk about some more minor things um what we could do to improve like the stop signs um and things of that nature larger signs putting the um the <laughs> signs that have the the strobe light blinkers around the so there's some minor things that we we accomplished today but ultimately they said that there's no major plans by mass dot to do anything there okay you know there's no question that you do have to if you if if you just stop at that stop sign you're crazy uh, because stopping at the stop sign does not give you the sight line you need but again i go over that i go through that intersection daily i don't see them but if they're there they're there um, so what do we do about 57,000, Brian? Um, so, so we have the, the difference between what, what the grant will cover and what, um, what, what we believe the estimates will come in, come in at. So we need to make up the difference if we're going to, you know, proceed with this design. I think Keith would agree that, that this culvert needs to be replaced. Um, so we are going to have to design it. Um, and, you know, we have the grant to, to, to pay for 57,000. Um, dollars of that design cost. Um, you know, my recommendation would be that it will be eligible for um, the, you know, we have around 480000 I think, $480,000 in CLFRF. So that's coronavirus local fiscal recovery funds, which infrastructure in, in, in uh, stormwater infrastructure in, in addressing climate change or eligible activities, which just would fall under. Um, so what about my record, yep. MVP. Um, it, it, it could also fall under MVP. Um, that's what we were thinking about for, for reconstruction that I don't know that the timing is going to work for MVP. Um, we need to spend this grant out by next June. Um, so I think the idea would be that we would need, um, that money prior to when the MVP application would be awarded which would probably be late next summer, probably. Um, so it would, you know, it would be somewhere on thirty to, you know, sixty thousand of that. Um, uh, we don't need to commit any of it tonight. I just wanted to uh, mm. just make the board aware that that there is this difference that that we'll likely need to make up, and that that's one possible source. Mm. Yeah, the difference being about like thirty three to sixty three thousand. Yeah, somewhere it'll be somewhere in that range. We don't know for sure where, but and the reason I mentioned the MVP, Brian, is that 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 um, 
COVID relief money is going to, it's going to be a feeding frenzy. Everyone's going to want a piece of that. And so the, the yeah. for those dollars is not going to be insignificant. Yep. And I, I, I have finally set up the, the, I sent the email out to schedule the first meeting of the, the CLFRF uh, committee. Um, that's going to sort of look at the process of how we, of how we go about um, prioritizing those projects. Um, in terms of, and I'll, we'll talk about MVP funding. Actually, it's a good segue. Um, so we can talk to Hannah. Um, but uh, you know, the, one of the thoughts of MVP is that that would that could cover the construction costs of the of replacing the culvert. So that's just really the status update of, of okay. where we are with that. Okay. Um, so MVP funding for action grant. Okay, so um, the town is currently going underway with our um, MVP action grant application process. We are in the very beginning stages, um, trying to uh, solidify our project um, going forward. So uh, with, in conversation with Andrew Smith, our regional MVP coordinator, um, we identified a few really pressing needs um, from among the community resilience building risk matrix that we assembled in June, 2021. Um, these needs are the need for culvert replacement in light of increased precipitation, especially this past summer. Um, lack of a comprehensive backup source for public water supply. We have two wells in the same aquifer. And if that aquifer were to be affected, both wells would be in trouble. Um, and then additionally, an emergency power generation and supply should there be some sort of emergency that would affect um, access to power supply. So um, the project suggestions that we've come up with recently are uh, the solar panel and battery installation. Yep, for the town offices. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Um, a new municipal well location assessment and water conservation strategy that's kind of to address both um, the need and use for water and also ways to cut down on that as we introduce a new source of water. Um, and then, like we were talking about before, the culvert survey or replacement coupled with invasive species removal. Um, all of these projects kind of aim to address a holistic um, method of addressing the problem that we brought up with Andrew Smith um, and also aim to be projects that could be broken down into manageable year long projects. Um, that was also emphasized by Andrew Smith in our meeting with him. So um, for next steps and due dates, you can see at the bottom of the document there, we're hoping to have our project chosen um, by the end of November so that we can begin drafting the expression of interest. Um, that's due by early to mid January so that uh, employees for the MVP uh, program can return comments to us. And then we're going to submit our official application in March. Do we know a timeline for when the um, when those grants are decided? Or I mean, I know they don't necessarily come when they say they will, but do they have a, um, will we not know until, I mean, I don't think April, but you know, in would we hear within three months, six months from there, you think? Um, I believe we would hear in the summer. I don't have the date in front of me. Um, oh, okay. So um, somewhere in three to six months after. Right. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. And, and, and is this predicated on um, what the budget looks like or no? The state. Um, budget, I mean. The uh, award amounts? Whether it gets awarded at all. I mean, is, is, is the money there and we know that for certain or is this going to be subject to appropriation? Yep. Yeah, so um, there's, uh, according to Andrew Smith, there's between 10 and $20 million of funding available for this program. Um, the maximum award is 2 million for competitive applications um, for towns. And then the regional maximum is 5 million. I guess then it strikes me that this decision would be made by June 30th. Cause that money will, cause if it's, if, if it's, if it's state budget money, it'll go away on June 30th. I, I can yeah. Wrong. I'm just, yeah. I, the money's there as, as, as I understand it. And yeah, I expect decisions okay. by, by the summertime. Yeah. Okay. And, and I just want to sort of echo what, what Hannah has said. Um, you know, these are, these are suggestions that we have um, for the board based on, you know, the, the, the risk matrix that was provided in the MVP plan. 
there was the Excel spreadsheet that I included in the, that we included in the meeting material. Um, and one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about it tonight was this idea of the solar panel and battery installation for the town offices. Um, it, it caught me off guard um, when we were on the phone call with Andrew. He was like, hey, we, you know, we're really looking to, you know, prioritize funds for solar, you know, solar panels with battery backup. Um, it came up in, in conversations um, that we were having about, about sheltering, but it occurred to us that we had talked about the town offices before and the, you know, the idea that the, the board has talked for a while about solar on, on town buildings and the town offices. And then it also occurred to us that the town appropriated $30,000 for a, a, a backup emergency generator for the town offices. Um, the reason being that there's a wet sprinkler system here. And if we were to have a loss of power for days and a freeze up, we would be in, in some trouble here. Um, and I know the, the Keith was, you know, move, moving forward with that project um, in terms of exploring what, what generators to purchase and uh, getting ready to pour the concrete pad. So we wanted to sort of have that discussion now before we have, you know, a generator in place and then get the instructions from the board that, hey, let's do this solar, you know, with battery backup instead. And then we already have the generator purchased. We wanted to hmm. avoid that, have that discussion before that happens. Um, uh, again, there's there's no guarantees that the MVP grant will be awarded or that that project will be awarded. Um, it's a competitive grant and um, that's that's pretty much where we stand. And I guess we're looking for guidance as to as to how to move forward with how to resolve that. Ryan, I have a, a question in regards to that. Is is this a something that the town needs to match a percentage of? Yeah, my understanding is that, and Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a 25% local match. That's correct. Yep, 25. Is that labor or cash? I think it can be, I, I think this is one that can be both unless I'm mixing up the grant programs because we've had a couple, yeah. um, but I think it can be in kind. All right, so I guess where I'm going with that is, you know, I feel that pretty quick then we at least need to do, get an estimate or some type of preliminary numbers for the solar panel battery installation and also determine how long or approximately how long these batteries would last um should we be out of power more than more than a day you know just i just need to know what the longevity of the supply of power back would be and so we need to have those comparisons pretty quick so we can make a decision you know personally i'm always yep. in favor of of, of solar and, and battery backup and that kind of stuff. I, you know, that's, that, that's, that's not adaptation. That's, well, that's both adaptation and mitigation of, of climate. And, that's, and I'm, I think that's fine and dandy as long as we don't find out that that what system they put in is, you know, only going to be um, capable of keeping you up for a day. Um, and then we run out of power and have nothing and freeze up. So we just need to make sure that mm -hmm. we're good. Yeah, it, it sounds like, I mean, there's a risk in a delay, right? That something happens in the interim. The other risk being we could be in the same place next year if we uh, don't get a grant that covers the cost of a system that would be required. Um, but I feel like that might be a really, that, that, that risk I think is acceptable to me. Um, and I, it, I know it, we don't have the, the numbers that you want right in front of us. We're not going to get those in the next two weeks. Um, so it's basically putting something off by something like a year. Um, and, uh, I think that risk is acceptable. I would like to invite, you know, there are Massachusetts is, is a, has a, has a pretty strong list of companies that do battery backup. Um, sadly, most of those companies are in the eastern part of the state and they're not based here in western Massachusetts. But yeah. I would like to, to see if we can invite a, a company that does battery backup 
to, to, to have them <clears throat> maybe come to our next meeting to talk about the, 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 the capacity of the batteries and, and how long they last and, and, and how it works. I, mm -hmm. I know I'd be, I, I think that would also be a selling feature to town people who, who watch these meetings so they understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my suggestion, but yeah, I'd like to hear what what the options and mm -hmm. capabilities are on that. Uh, I also would want to look into the the well location because that yeah that of, of the things on this list that could be the most damaging should there you know, for the most people that you know, if there was a problem somehow the the source the aquifer for the town wells were to become fouled or not usable, that would be a much bigger problem for a much greater number of people. It would, for, the, for, the, for the future of the town in general. Right. But, you know, we spent, I, I forget how much money on the, the, the redirection of the Mill River to, to get that, that wellhead secure back 15 years ago was it maybe 12 i don't i don't remember exactly um and and to to now potentially move it 15, 12 you know 12 to 15 years later if that's what people are suggesting i, I don't think the suggestion I, is to move it i think the suggestion is to at least find an alternative site that can be tapped into uh, in addition to it, rather not instead of it. Okay, that's that's the way I take this. Yeah, yeah. The, the the vulnerability that exists is that is that we have two wells drawing from the same aquifer, a hundred feet apart, and that if something were to happen to that aquifer, that um, we don't have a backup source of water other than relying on our neighbors to the to the south or north. Um, <clears throat> but it's not a long term solution. So. The idea is to investigate backup sources in terms of how I think how Hannah and I were thinking about it is um, if we want to, we would explore these, uh, these three options. Um, we would have conversations with the water department, obviously, and say, um, is this something that, that they're interested in, in looking at? And then also have conversations with Keith about, you know, how we approach the culverts part of this. And so in the, with, uh, with the target idea of, of submitting an expression of interest in Janu in mid-January. But if we don't wanna pursue these three tracks, it would be good to know now that, you know, in the middle of January, we come to the board with this, you know, nice polished idea and we hear that it's not how the board wants to go forward. So um, just some direction on what we wanna pursue for the MVP grant. Okay. So I guess, our, can we can we put? What do you need from us tonight, Brian? Anything? Um, are these three? I guess are are these three um, project ideas something that the board wants us to uh, explore in greater in greater depth? I guess. Yeah, or, or other ideas. I I like these. Um, I think uh, I would not have necessarily put forward solar with batteries, the absence of the feedback you got from them saying we're really psyched about solar with batteries. Um, but uh, uh, and I was pleasantly surprised to hear that. So uh, the yes, absolutely put that on there. And I think the other two are um, important things that we would have put on there regardless. Can someone help me understand, and I admit that I don't understand why the invasive species removal has to be part of the culvert, culvert survey or replacement? Yeah, I can help with that. So um, Andrew requested that, um, or rather mentioned that the most competitive applications had really holistic um, ways of addressing the problem. So Brian, if you scroll down a little bit, um, it'll show the MVP core principles and um, our goal is to address not only the need for culvert replacement, but um, the systems around it as well. Culverts are currently getting um, 
plugged up by invasive species in the area. And actually we were talking about this earlier at the DOT meeting, um, Thragmites, uh, which is one of those like really tall reedy plants next to um, culverts that grow in wetlands, um, block road visibility um, and they negatively affect the um, ecosystems around the culverts as well. So we're hoping to create kind of a more competitive um, application by including that aspect. Okay. I think a factor here, certainly of what we would end up proposing or recommending is what the selection committee would be looking for. What application had the greatest chance of success? You know, so if he's, if Andrew's saying that they're really into batteries, well, that certainly is something we have to consider. I mean, I personally, I, I really do like the battery concept because it, it's both adaptation and mitigation. And and if you just adapt, you're you're essentially throwing up your arms for mitigation pieces as well. And and I, and I think doing both simultaneously, whenever possible, mm -hmm. is important. Um, so okay, I think these three are fine. Is that a consensus, Fred and Joyce, that these three are yep. are, are are fine right now? They look fine um, to me. Yeah, I think that's a sounds like a consensus to me. Okay, I, I would like to get a little bit more information on the capacity necessary to. To, 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 to keep the public buildings operating for more than an hour um, in a crisis situation would be helpful in terms of allowing us to wrap our arms around or our heads around um, what makes the most sense and what will provide the best return on the investment. Um, and so I'd, I'd, I'd leave that in, in Hannah and Brian's lap to, to see if they can, they can find someone who could enumerate on that. I think we need to know if this is a, a credible alternative to the backup generator. Yeah. Right. I mean, one of the things that was, was I had I had long conversations after Irene came through years ago, I was having a conversation with um, the, 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 the Berkshire County Sheriff and how, and it was also, it was also around whatever the storm was in New Jersey a dozen years ago or so, whatever that you know the, the 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 gasoline is there all these things are there but there's no electricity to access any of these things so solar can keep the the, the pumps mm -hmm. running you know yeah. it, it stinks to have something in the ground and you can't access it because there's no power um of, of sufficient scale um so to, to, to put solar up on a building so that it, we, can, we can keep the, the clocks moving. And, and also keep in mind that, you know, the, the battery doesn't necessarily have a shelf life because if, if a storm comes through, the sun comes out again. It's not like there's a, there's a finite number of hours that, and the battery is never going to get regenerated. Um, the, the thing keeps living. So... You know, a big snowstorm comes through. It's not like the, it's not a nuclear winter where the sun never comes back. Yep. So, okay, let's move on. Um, updates, Brian. Um, yeah, so I'll follow up with John Dewey. I guess there must have been some miscommunication um, unless he happens to walk in. Um, but, um, um, other updates that we haven't talked about, um, just a reminder of the Veterans Memorial Dedication Ceremony that's tomorrow, uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. at the Veterans Memorial in the center of town adjacent to the town hall. Um, again, that's at one o'clock. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share was that uh, Amy Lavalley had, had uh, uh, sent a question out to some of our surrounding towns about, uh, the board had talked a little bit uh, last time about, about, um, persons holding multiple positions and possible, you know, issues that, that come with that. Um, and what, and I included the, the email response that, that Amy had sent to me to, to the board or that was sent to the board. Um, and none of our other towns really have anything like that. Um, so I, I, I just mentioned that, um, if it's something we want to consider, it would, I think we would, 
maybe broaden our scope to see what other towns have done or or look to you know do something so it strikes me that we don't have that kind of luxury to 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 limit who serves on what board because we have such a a a, a um deficiency in in people wanting to to volunteer their time that you know it 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 is what it is yeah. it's don't the state ethic laws require disclosure, basically? Yeah. Um, in, in certain situations, right? Yeah. Disclosure is a remedy to yeah. to a conflict. Yeah. Okay. And those are those are specific situations. Right. Yeah, it might not include. Yeah. I serve on this other board, therefore I need to disclose that because that's public information. It's not really. Yeah, proper. that that wouldn't be a disclosure issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, um, so I, I'm, I'm not really sure what, how to proceed on that or. Um, I don't know that I really understand what the problem, uh, the perceived problem is because. Um, the, the perceived, I, the, since I raised it, the perceived yeah. problem is having an individual or individuals with too, that could have too much input on particularly on particular subjects where okay. if you have multiple boards, including the select board and zoning board of appeals, for instance, both having to pass judgment on some a project mm -hmm. or a planning board to have the same person sitting on more than one of those places gives that person an awful lot of power. Yeah. And, and do we have any, that yeah, do we have anybody who's, um, on both of any of those three boards? C currently, um, no. Currently, no. Okay. Well, and, and we, ha we, we have, but we yeah. also do not want to create policy based upon individual personality. Right. No. No, we do not. Correct. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it, if if we had people lining up for for for, for board representation, I'd think, well, maybe we can looking at this, but we just, we just don't, um, you know, I, 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 I agree with you. We don't have an awful lot of people lining up. I just think it, it's something that should be out there and at least a consideration when openings occur to try to avoid having this happen. And try to recruit, right? And try to try to recruit People need to recruit the same replacements. Right. Well, and, and, and to Fred's point, the one thing that we do want to do is if we wanted to form some type of a policy, now would be the time to do it so that it isn't perceived as personality driven. That that there's no nobody has any skin in the game, no one's being second guessed for the decisions that they're making. It is it is entirely because we want to avoid um, these situations, you know. Personally, I think that we should absolutely not have this have the same person sitting on the planning board and the finance committee because those two committees are easily, all due respect to my select board colleagues, are easily the most powerful two committees in town, with the select board probably down around number six or seven. Um, <laughs> it's just the reality of it. it, it it's it's fine, and it's why I'll I'll admit. I think that those two committees should be appointed not just by one person, but by a variety of, you know, you, two, two people are appointed by the select board, two people are appointed by the moderator, two people are appointed by I don't care what, so that there is, they're easily the two most powerful committees. on. In, in I, I would add Zoning Board of Appeals to that for the, because of the granting of special permits. Okay, I mean, sure. So, but but yeah. but who appoints ZBA? We do. I think we, we do. do. Right. So at least that's three. I mean, I mean, I'm just saying. So so maybe you're afraid. You're right. I I I just think that to make sure that we're getting a a, a variety of flavors of individuals mm -hmm. with different backgrounds and different perspectives, um, we 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 should be appointing people. With, with, you know, again, two people, two people, two, or whatever it is, so that 
individuals don't have that much authority and control and it has nothing to do with right. I mean, as I said, my, my, my concern is when you have the same person potentially having influence over a, a project that has to go through multiple committees. Right. And, and, and my point is, is that those two committees being appointed by one person, mm-hmm. that's easy to, I can see someone saying, Oh, you know, I want, why don't you sit on both? And we're gonna we're gonna run the show. That's that's entirely possible. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that it's necessarily you know who's appointing. It sounds it's who's serving that might be the easier thing to um, to I mean, kind of have a policy about who's a, who's appointing could be a simple vote of town meeting. A very that's a bylaw meeting. change, right? Exactly. Yeah. In some instances, it's a bylaw change. Um, so yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I just wanted to understand. If there's like resentment because there's uh, a, a person who either now or in the past has uh, exerted their influence over too many committees. If that's one, I mean, then that, that's probably happened before in another place, and that would be uh, one place to look. Or is it um, resentment over uh, you know one person being able to help determine? The, or to basically appoint two really important committees, if if that's the thing we're looking at, I just I don't really know which one it is. It sounds like what Fred's talking about and what John's talking about are slightly different. I think they can feed off of each other. Is my point, Joyce? I hmm. I think they are potentially different symptoms of the same problem. Yeah, because it it really could be, you know. Um, Joe Sixpack appoints Josephine Sixpack to two incredibly powerful committees. And then suddenly Josephine Sixpack and Joe Sixpack have figured out a way to really, really run the show. So it, it, it is now that I, you know, this is great that we're talking it through because it, it is, it has given me more. At first, the topic didn't have a lot of credibility in my mind, and, and now it, it really does have more. And especially because there's nobody in that situation now, so we're not going to be seen as just picking on a personality. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, so um, John is in the waiting room. Oh, Okay. Um, yeah, we should have we should have tabled that issue till next time. We could have been <laughs> off the air and it, <laughs> I don't know that I I don't know that we ever talked about what time. So it may I will take responsibility for that. Yes, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Is he in? Yes, I, I see he's him coming in. Yeah, he's not connected yet. We can still talk about him then, huh? So in, in terms of next steps, we're going to do a town charter. No, just kidding. There we go. <laughs> no. Town change. charter committee. Just the bylaw change. I have no problem pushing it. <laughs> All right. Uh, John Dewey. What do you Yes, have? Brian. Uh, welcome. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. 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 Okay. Um, I can't see I just, you, though. Oh, I am actually in my car. Unfortunately, I've been stuck in traffic. So um, I wonder if I can do audio or mm-hmm. video. Okay. Hold on one sec. Uh, no, me... no, don't pay attention. Well, to audio is fine. fine. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I think I know most of the select board members. I want to give you a quick update uh, with the request. I know we've had some email exchange, Brian and myself, over the last uh, few weeks ago weeks or so bottom line is unfortunately our tenant we'd been working with for the last two and a half years dr rob farms has fallen out Uh, they are so busy and focused on their project in southern california that their uh, investor partners were not willing to support them expanding to the east coast at this time Mm -hmm. unfortunately that required us to terminate their lease that we'd signed with them about four months ago and we're now looking for a replacement tenant uh, cultivator. But that, uh, that process may take some time and knowing that it could take some time, what we would like to do 
is move forward with you on a new host community agreement so that we could start the licensing process with the CCC and then at John, you just muted. Yep. One, one sec. I got another call and then I had to drop that. So can you hear me now? Mm, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, at such time that we execute a new lease, then I would like to circle back in front of the, uh, the select board, do another community outreach with the new cultivator, and then either amend or substitute them into our HCA with you. So in a perfect world, I'd love to move forward with a new host community agreement with you in the near future. And then, so we could start the state licensing process. And then when we get the new tenant, circle back to you and have you approve the new tenant. And at that time, either do an amendment to the HCA, substitute them in. Um, but at the state level, the CCC then would allow us to assign the license to our new tenant, a simple change of ownership form. So I, I'm trying to be time efficient. Um, and from our perspective, having had the license with NAP advisors, our tenant, caused some issues because our interests were not aligned. They worked on the licensing, we worked on the real estate, and it was two, um, two paths in a wood and they diverged. And we wanna keep control of the licensing until such time that we have a tenant cultivator identified and then merge the tenant into the HCA and the CCC license at the time they execute the lease, not prior to that. Does that make sense? I, I, I think so. I, I'm having a hard time following the, the, the pathway, but. Yeah, my understanding, if, if I understand what you're saying there and from the other emails, is that basically you want to like do all the groundwork for some other operator. And Correct. so. And so you're, the value you're adding to this company is doing all the groundwork, getting all the permits, getting all the HCAs and the licensing, and then turn that license over to whoever pays you the most money. Well, essentially, it has to I mean, be the, it's right, it has they, to they be would the have right. to buy your company. So no, you do all no. the, the our, upfront our work. Goal, Joyce, our goal oh. is to be a landlord at the property. Our goal is always to be the real estate owner and lease it to the cultivator. We are not interested in selling the license or the facility. We want to be a long-term owner of the real estate and we want to lease it to a cultivator, but we do want to do uh, the groundwork for them up front. So we save each other six to nine months of dealing with the CCC. And the CCC lets you but, transfer the license to a different company. Yes. Well, not a different company. We would, um, we would sell the membership interest in uh, the new LLC. So we've created a new LLC called Waitley Cultivation Partners LLC, a Massachusetts LLC. That is the entity that we love to execute a new host community agreement with you. That is the entity that will apply for a new tier 11 license with the state CCC. And then once we sign a new lease with a new tenant, then we will assign to them for no charge, the interest in the licensed entity so they can step into the license once they've signed the lease. So we're not looking to make any profit on the license. We just want a tenant that is uh, credit worthy and qualified and, you know, can do compliance and uh, pay the rent. So for us as a landlord, it's all about finding a tenant that can uh, be a good tenant and pay the rent. John, what happens if you don't find that? What happens if we go through this process and then you guys don't find that, that, that quality of a tenant? You know, there's always a fallback in which we decide to be a cultivator. Um, as you know, I'm a real estate investor, developer. I have no prior experience in the cultivation business. At my age, it's not something I was interested in getting involved in. Um, 
But that is a fallback that's necessary. We can always hire consultants and get into the cultivation business and be the landlord and the tenant cultivator. But I, I put the probability of that as, you know, 10% at best. We, we have started to search for a new tenant cultivator over the last uh, 45 days. And we're probably speaking to half a dozen different companies, uh, some from the West Coast, some from Massachusetts already, and some from the Midwest and even one Canadian outfit. So we do have half a dozen interested players that are in the, uh, the initial phases of due diligence. And due diligence for them is getting comfortable with the size of the facility. This is a very large facility. They're all interested in phasing their occupancy. So we've designed it so they could occupy in four phases. Uh, and the greenhouse lays itself out nicely for a four-phased occupancy with roughly 80,000 square feet in the north half of the greenhouse and 80,000 square feet in the south half. And then we have the, uh, the central processing corridor that becomes their main uh, harvesting and storage and curing and packaging facility. So the, uh, the facility lends itself to phasing, but that's, that's, it takes a while for these firms to get comfortable with it. We are only talking to cultivators that have experience in a 100,000 square foot facility already. So they're comfortable with a very large operation. And we're looking for companies that in general have about a $10 million net worth on their balance sheet and $5 million per year of uh, EBITDA, net, net income. So we have some financial qualifications that have been set forth by our lender. Dr. Rob met those qualifications in California, but their equity investors said, you know, California, you're maybe 18 months behind schedule here and you're maybe a year behind your projections. So, you know, we're just not ready to support moving to the East Coast at this time. So, you know, these projects, they always take longer than you think and they always seem to cost more has been my experience. Okay. Um, I, I guess if, if it's a, for me, if it's a question of expediting the process to allow whoever is the ultimate cultivator to, to um, get up and running as quickly as possible, I have no problem with what's being proposed. I, I, it, it's going to be a question I have after this is over um, for, for, for other other uh, companies, uh, to Brian, um, but the, the 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 snail's pace of this stuff is driving me up a wall in terms of economic development for the town of Whaley. Um, yes, you know I could care less about about the consumption. I I I want economic development in, done in the right way and in in, in a smart way, um, and it's not happening. So personally, if if, if it's all about making sure that there's a, a seamless transition and we can get a, a, a strong company that's providing uh, some, some economic bloodlines to the town, I, I'm all for it. And if Brian thinks that that, 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 that will, um, that this process will facilitate expedition, then personally, I'm, oh, let's do it. And I would put it in Joyce's hands. I'm, I'm trying to save us. I'm trying to save us nine months of doing it in parallel versus mm -hmm. doing it sequentially because we did it sequentially before. And I, I don't know if you know the exact timing, but you, you signed the HCA with uh, NAP advisors in July of 2019. It took them six months to complete the application that they filed in December of 19. CCC had a couple of information requests in 2020. They finally get their approval 12 months later at the end of 2020. And then it took another four months for architectural review. The good news is the CCC has told us that now that they've given a license on a previously approved facility, it'll go much quicker a second time around. You know, the architectural review is a checkbox now. Um, the, the new entity has one owner to it. It's actually my wife, Rebecca. So we have a little bit of separation. 
So it's a approval process. We are as frustrated as you are with how long it took for NAP to get through the state, number one, and then we signed a lease in uh, June, we closed the purchase with DeWitt in August, and then here we are, they told us in, uh, in September, October, that they're not gonna be able to perform. You know, why didn't they tell us that a year ago? Um, it's just how the process works. So, you know, DeWitt has been completely kept in the loop on our progress here, and he's, he's willing, willing to work with us on this uh, delay, but our goal would be to do community outreach before your December meeting from Joyce's for the exact same, you know, HCA we signed, uh, NAP did uh, 24 months ago with you. We want to accelerate the process to get our tenant in the building because you don't get any HCA fees until they occupy and start producing. So we're as motivated as you are to accelerate the process. All right. Um, I would throw it in Joyce's hands to create this thing. And uh, yeah, so it sounds like it won't be when, when you said the exact same HCA. I think there were some of the things you mentioned about when there's a tenant, we're going to do this, that, and the other. Those kind of things we probably have to put in the HCA. We'd want to put that in writing as well. So yeah, it sounds like it's bounced to the, uh, to the HCA subcommittee. Good. <laughs> And, and Joyce mm -hmm. and Ryan, if you like, I can do a markup and try and add in those uh, those little uh, additions to it and give you something to uh, to look at. I can ping that back to both of you uh, tomorrow morning if you like. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Ryan, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yep. Good. That works Brian, for me. Brian, there was one other matter which I wanted to run by you. Uh, my attorney has been reaching out to David Dineski on the uh, Chapter 61A tax question. Yep. And the current, because there's no guidance from the state on this topic, um, because you know the state ag committee um, came out with a memo that said they believe that cannabis production does qualify for the agricultural exemption, but that would take state uh, legislature to change the rules to make it happen. So we're kind of in this gray area. So our proposal through David Dineski to your assessor is that we do it on a prorated basis because the parcel is about 40 acres, about four acres is the greenhouse, which is intended for conversion to a cannabis production but the remaining 36 acres outside the building would remain in ag production. You know, I'll probably lease it back to DeWitt or Bernie for strawberries or potatoes or something like that. So our proposal is that four fortieths, roughly 10% of the property would come out of 61A, but the remaining agricultural land around the greenhouse would remain in 61A. If you can support a uh, a split uh, tax roll on a single parcel, if that's possible. Could, uh, that's actually probably not a topic for this meeting. We no, have an agenda that's a, you're bringing a new item up where we can't really discuss that and try to make any decisions. It sounds like it's way far away from our expertise anyway. Yeah. I was, yeah. was going to say that same thing, Joyce. So, I, And I agree with that too. I, but I also have a question on that property. How much yes. of these, how much of the solar plant is you know part of that 36 acres because that's not agricultural that's that's true uh the solar field is 600 kw it occupies a space that is about uh do we would know the numbers for sure maybe it's 100 150 feet wide and 300 feet long so maybe that's uh two acres of solar panels on the uh, ag area you're absolutely right about that so I'll, I'll follow up with, with town council and the assessors to make sure that they're communicating. Okay, I appreciate it, Brian. So sorry to uh, sorry to bring up a topic that was inappropriate for the select board. Okay, no, that's that's fine. Um, 
uh, we just can't add any value and, and we don't want to talk about stuff that we don't add value to. So you will communicate right. with Brian and Joyce and we will look forward to hearing um, results. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Yep, Thank you all. Bye. Brian, are you done with your town administrator updates? Yeah, I think so. So the, the only thing that I would add, and I don't want to belabor this, but and, and maybe it's something that, that Hannah can help with, but I'm I've been increasingly frustrated with the lack of movement on on any marijuana uh, com you know, company efforts in Waitley. Um, I'm also interested to hear, so I'd like an update on all the, all the different um, packages that are trying to move forward. Yep. Uh, regardless of whether it's state, it's in the state's hands or whether they're trying to clean the floors or whatever it is, because nothing's open. Um, I want, love yeah, one is open. One is, but I would love Colorado. to. Have, I would. Which one is that, by the way? Uh, the DMCTC. Where is, is cultivating on River Road? Yeah, right, right, right. That's what I thought. Right. Yep. Um, I would love to have an update on the um, Blue School process um, because I I heard news a month ago, and I'm just wondering where that is. And yep. I know and maybe you guys talked about it last meeting that I was not unable to attend. But I, I'd love to to hear where we are on the center school. Yep. Oh yeah, you weren't. You weren't. That's right. That's right. Was that discussed? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. See the minutes. It was, it's in the minutes you abstained on. <laughs> okay. See, uh, let's I'll, let's touch base on that. And I'll talk with you on that offline. I apologize for that. Okay. Yep. Okay. All and right. We adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. Joyce. Hi. Fred. Hi. Me. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good night, you guys. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.